My name is Marco Hansen. I'm Margaret Hansen. Also called La Le, La Mera Mera. <laughs> she's, in, she's in charge around here. Um, we're joining you live from the studios of Text and Translation. <laughs> Welcome to the show. It's not really a studio. It's our little office here in Austin. Um, we are legal translators and interpreters, and we're both from Brownsville. And we work with um, a lot of the legal aid groups and uh, immigration attorneys and family law attorneys around the state. And I've noticed that a lot of them have bilingual staff who um, help with the interpretation and sometimes interpreting in court uh, when they go before the judge. And I get asked a lot in court, hey, how do you become an interpreter? And it's there's several steps in the process and it's not real clear if you if you Google it. And so our hour here today is just to walk you through the process, casually, informally, how you become a credentialed court interpreter in Texas, especially, but if you're somewhere else, then the steps are pretty similar in most of the other states in the US. Yeah, I see we've got somebody from California, so we welcome you. Oh, cool. Yeah. So uh, are we recording this? Yes, and it, okay. it will go on YouTube. Okay, and so if, you, if that matters to you, then keep your camera off if it um, it, you won't be on screen much, if at all, um, except right here at the beginning and at the very end, but, um, as much as we would love to see your shining faces, um, it's fine to keep the camera off. Yeah, but it's nice to have at least a couple people on there so we don't feel like we're talking to each other. Hi, Esther. Thank you. Oh, hi. Oh, it's a real person. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yay. all right. So, uh, this is a picture of uh, Lorena Devlin, who's a friend of ours here in Austin, and she was a state court interpreter and is now a federal interpreter. She's a staff interpreter for the federal courts in Austin. And um, let's see, should I should I do the whole screen thing? Is that better? Uh, we, then, yes. we, then we can't see the notes. Yeah. Oh, I'll put the notes on over on the other side. So. If somebody could just confirm with your thumb up or your emoji thumb up that you can see our PowerPoint slide on, make sure I'm sharing the right screen. That's harder than it seems. It should say, what is court interpreting? Can you see that? No. No. Mm. Okay, okay. So stop the share. Stop share and reshare. I've only done this like every day since the pandemic one. began and I'm still getting it wrong. Okay, how about now? Can you see it? <laughs> All right, yes. over to you, yes. Margaret. <laughs> well done. Dave. Ahora sí se puede ver. Why, yes. why am I driving? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so first of all, let's let's have a quick little conversation about what is court interpreting, because that's what we're going to be addressing today. And if you're not even sure what, what we're talking about, then that's going to make it tricky for you to pursue a career in this field. So interpreting is going between two spoken or signed languages uh, to facilitate communication among people who do not also speak those languages. So for example, in this case, we're going to be doing Spanish and English. Uh, we're going to be discussing Spanish and English interpreting. And so if you've got somebody who only speaks one language and somebody else who only speaks the other, you need an interpreter in between to help them communicate. Translation is, it involves written documents. And so um, you won't hear about, for example, an ASL or a sign language translator because they don't deal with written documents usually. Um, they only deal with the spoken or signed word. Uh, the court part um, is a little bit of a misnomer. It does involve court, but sometimes you're not in a courtroom doing the interpreting. Um, you may be in a law office or, or some other setting, um, but it does involve legal interpreting legal language and so uh, that's court interpreting in a nutshell all right oh oh one more point on my slide before i move on um ai is not affecting this field yet seriously because um spoken language is just too hard for ai to grasp and mark is going to talk about that a little bit more on the next slide um but it's just it's harder than it seems to understand what a person is saying with various accents and um, speech patterns and mannerisms and mumbling and looking away from the microphone or whatever, in, in addition to things like figures of speech or sarcasm or, or cultural embedded language. 
Um, so we don't really need to worry about AI yet. All right. Click. Thank you. Click. So here are some examples of the kind of uh, complicated language that humans can make sense of and computers can't. We have a handwritten note on the left that has some bad spelling and bad grammar and some confusing uh, word choices. But if I read it as a human, I can figure out, oh, I know what this, this person is talking about. I promise to be true to the American flag and to the country. It stands for a country that can't be divided where everyone gets freedom and fairness or, or fairness. ferns or ferns. Um, this is, I can tell this is somebody trying to remember in his own words, the, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, because you know, it, it, it's reminiscent of that cultural knowledge that I have, even though it's an unusual form of that text. And then on the right, we have an example of somebody giving the um, lyrics to a song from the 90s uh, using emojis and abbreviations and stuff. Can anybody recognize what song that is? So it's a theme song from a TV show. We can't see the chat right now, can we? So uh, we can get a notification if it yeah, pops up. Yeah, that is from Fresh Prince Fresh of Prince. Bel Air. Yeah. You ding, got ding, 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 it. Theme well song done. for Fresh yeah. Prince of Bel Air. So if you just fed that into a computer, it would have no idea what we're talking about. So these are the kind of things that humans are really good at, um, reading between the lines and getting the gist of some something that somebody else is saying. Margaret? Okay, so um, is it worth being court interpreter? How much am I going to get paid anyway? So a little um, sampling, uh, an informal survey of uh, court interpreters uh, say that well over half of them are getting paid between 80 and 120 dollars an hour so on average um, and some of those even more the, the blue in the middle there 15.6 percent is over 120 dollars an hour so um so 100 110 is is very doable um as a court interpreter and this is as of last november so these are current figures mm -hmm. post pandemic are we post pandemic maybe fairly post pandemic yeah. All right. And then we also, in the same survey, um, another question was, is there enough work? If you are a freelance interpreter, do you have enough jobs to uh, make a living? And the majority here, Blue, said, I stay busy interpreting and turn down assignments frequently. And then the red category, I have enough assignments to fit my lifestyle. Maybe it's somebody who just wants to work part time or it's a, it's a second job. And so, yes, especially most of these were Spanish court interpreters in Texas who answered. Um, and so the market is is um, plentiful. And if you are working a full time job and you're not looking for freelance work, then this doesn't apply to you now. But maybe as your next career, maybe when you move on, you want to try something new. Um, you could start um, freelancing as a court interpreter and um, be self employed in a, later on. I think this one's yours. Uh, it's it's not actually all of them for some reason are saying they're right. Oh, okay. So yeah. Right. Off. So I'm not going to do the whole presentation. Whatever. <laughs> so how do you become a court interpreter? Uh, the steps in general for spoken languages like Spanish in most states like Texas. First, you have to be bilingual and biliterate. Uh, you have to be able to read and write in two languages, English and another language. And uh, most of us who call ourselves bilingual are really good in one language and we're pretty good in another language but we have like uh, different uh, we use the languages in different ways maybe one is the language we went to school in and were educated in and the other one is one that we just know socially from our family or where we grew up and so you may need to um, do some work on whatever your weaker language is um, getting better at uh, understanding that and speaking it uh, in both formal and informal settings once you are fairly bilingual then you need to learn how to interpret and again, uh, interpret is like translation, except it's out loud, it's spoken. And everybody who's bilingual has done some interpreting. And if you grew up bilingual, you probably did a lot for your cousins or your grandma or, or your neighbors. Um, but uh, interpreting in a casual social setting is much more relaxed and, and low stakes than it is interpreting in court where somebody's liberty and money is on the line. And so as you study interpretation as an adult, you focus more on accuracy and um, having a really large vocabulary and being able to keep up with pe people as they speak quickly. After you get comfortable interpreting in different settings, maybe 
as an additional duty, maybe take interpreting classes, maybe you interpret for your church or house of worship or at your kid's school or some, somewhere other than court, um, then you set the goal of passing the interpreting exams and the state of Texas, along with something like 44 of the other states share the same written and oral exam. They're produced by a, a national organization, the NCSC, and you have to pass the written test before you can take the oral test. And then once you pass the oral test and the background check and some other bureaucratic steps, then you are authorized to interpret in any court in the state. And there are almost 3000 courts around the state of Texas from the municipal and JP level all the way up through the courts of appeals and the Supreme Court. And so there are, are many opportunities and something like a one in seven Texans is a limited English proficient Spanish speaker. And so a seventh of the state population needs an interpreter when they are forced to appear in court, either as a witness or a defendant or a plaintiff or some other party. And so there is plenty of need for um, qualified and trained interpreters. And then if you're on your own, if you're a freelancer, um, the fourth step is marketing your services and building your client list and getting out there and doing a good job so people will hire you again and refer other clients to you. But that's sort of beyond the scope of today's presentation, we're going to pretty much talk about the first three steps here. Okay, so learn a second language. You don't have to have grown up knowing your second language. You don't have to be a native speaker. It doesn't have to be something that, like, that you just, you're exactly as good in your second language as your first. You don't have to speak without an accent or, or know the entire dictionary's worth of words, but you do need to be able to speak with fluency and accuracy. You need a broad base of knowledge about all kinds of different fields and interests and, and at different levels of formality. You, you need to know how to speak to a judge in your second language, just like you know how to speak to your buddy at the club You need to, and, and what's in between. All right, and so um, after you learn your second language, the second step in this uh, roadmap is learning to interpret. And there are lots of self-study interpreting materials. This one is called The Interpreter's Edge from Holly Mickelson at Acebo. This is one of the uh, classic textbooks that people use to study interpretation on their own. Uh, there are recordings, there are online courses. I teach some classes for interpreters. There are several colleges around Texas that have interpreting programs that you can take either in person or remotely. Um, and in all of them, it's helpful to have a study buddy, a partner who's doing the same thing, or even a family member who's willing to sit down and work with you and read stuff aloud and let you interpret it and record it, and then you play it back and you evaluate it. There are also many places that are looking for uh, interpreter volunteers, like here in Austin, I think twice a month, we have a free legal clinic where lawyers will sit down in a cafeteria at a public school and offer free legal aid uh, pro bono and interpreters uh, volunteer and just walk around and interpret for anybody who doesn't speak English. Um, that's a great setting because you're dealing with legal vocabulary, but the stakes are lower. Everybody understands it's a volunteer deal, and so you don't have to have a credential, and they're just happy to have somebody there who can um, help them communicate more or less. You, uh, a lot of you are already working for legal aid, and so you may be doing interpreting as an additional duty as part of your job, which is great. Somebody is paying you to expand your skills. Um, Maybe after this job, uh, you'll look for work as a full time interpreter at a medical clinic or a hospital or for a school district or some other setting outside of the courts. And in learning in practicing interpretation, there's all these mental skills and muscles in your brain that you're working out that have to get uh, faster and more accurate and have greater stamina to go for longer periods of time. Um, you'll learn more accents from different parts of the world. Spanish is spoken in as an as an official or major language in I think 23 countries and some of those have several different dialects within the country and different social classes within each dialect will speak it a different way and so it's, there's just a vast world of um, language out there to explore and again we don't know all of it there's I learn new words every day in English and in Spanish and it's it's sort of a, a lifelong journey but the more interpreting you do in the more kinds of contexts for people from more places, the uh, 
the more comfortable that you'll feel when you stand before a judge and a jury. And you'll also be working on uh, paying real close attention, like, is somebody ever just talking and you just totally zone them out and... I'm sorry, were you say, <laughs> saying something? I got And you, your mind somewhere else and you don't even realize it? Interpreters have to be like the cat chasing the laser beam, you know, just totally focused and, and not wanting to miss a single word. And that takes practice. Um, and then there's all these like puzzles to solve where there's an untranslatable term or an idea and you just get stumped and sort of fall off the horse and it gallops away from you while you try to figure out how do you say that in Spanish? And I just collected. Or English. Yeah, or whatever language for those of you who may have another language. And so some examples, um, you wanna go through these? And yeah, sure. Get a drink of water. Yeah, and uh, let this Okay. Listening. Okay, so here's some idiomatic expressions or just phrases that would be a little awkward to go directly from one language to the next. So for example, put the pedal to the metal. What does that mean? If, any, we... if you wanna put in the chat your ideas, that'd be cool. Oh yeah, how would you say put the pedal to the metal? I know how. I would render that, but... Um, Dale gas, says that, Shimada. That's exactly how I would do it. That's what I... Yeah, as soon as I thought of it. I can picture that commercial from the Valley from... Yeah, yeah. Bird from high school. Yeah. yeah. It's a car yeah. dealership. And then here's another one. Um, if the... If maybe you're being cross-examined, not you, but your witness or something is being cross-examined and, and the attorney asks, did you say he's your attorney or your lawyer? How would you say that in Spanish? Dijo que es su abogado o su letrado, licenciado. Maybe. And those are other words for for lawyer, but they don't have the same feel of like more formal and less formal. Right. Counselor is more representante legal. I hear somebody talking, but I couldn't Maybe hear. put it in the chat. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Abogado licenciado. Those are two words for lawyer, but they don't right. exactly equate to the the feel of the difference between the synonyms in English, in my opinion. Right, right. And and the other problem is that probably they're asking, last time we talked to you, which word did you use? And she may let's say that the witness used the same word both times and the interpreter used attorney one time and lawyer another time and so maybe Different it's not even yeah maybe it's not even the the witness's word but the interpreter's word choice that's being brought into question and and, and is it significant enough to matter mm. and i've seen this like where somebody gives a deposition with one interpreter and then they go to trial with a different interpreter and at the deposition the interpreter uh, chose the word uh, for camioneta, they interpreted it as um, pickup truck. And then in trial, the interpreter interpreted camioneta as SUV. And then it looks to the the jury like the witness is changing testimony, saying pickup truck in one place and SUV in another. And, and in cross-examination, the attorney is trying to find out, well, is it a pickup truck or an SUV? And it's it's the same term going back in the camioneta. And so there's this disconnect because people can't um can't really get at the idea in both languages all right all right and y'all are bringing up some good points in the uh chat as well yeah or troca yes and licenciado and yeah so <laughs> so the point being it, it it's confusing and it's it's not always totally clear and and there's rarely one correct answer right it's an art not a science um admit that she bore you a child and again, the child going into Spanish, in Spanish, there are more gender specific terms. You could say menor, but you don't bear a menor, you bear <laughs> a bebe, but then a bebe is not a child, a bebe is a baby. And if the guy saying that, you know, did, did she, like, did she bear you a, Nino, and he's like, well, no, she had a girl, so I guess that's this one's not mine. And he says, no. But in English, it sounds like he's denying that she bore any child at all, because in English, it's gender neutral. Right. It's just, yeah. So, criatura. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's if, a lot easier to, to discuss it here than it is to do if, if on demand. I like Elisa's solution, but you'd have to be thinking ahead to foresee the upcoming confusion to choose that word quick enough. Yeah. And then flipping the other direction in English, fue antro con mi comadre. 
So if I were talking about my comadre, I would know that I'm talking about a woman who is my close friend. Definition, godmother of my child, right? But also my girlfriend. But if if the interpreter then says she went to the club with her girlfriend. <laughs> bestie, yes. Bestie, yeah, yeah. You could say bestie. Um, yeah, if I say she went with her girlfriend, then all of a sudden it, it conjures up the image of a partnership, a, yeah, yeah. a romantic partner. Right. And if you say, I went to the nightclub with a friend, then we've eliminated that it's a close friend and that it's a female. And so we've lost a little context there. And so um, how about tocayo? Mi tocayo me puso el ojo. Oh, I, this one's I, I put weird. this on, on Facebook last week for all of my English only speaking friends because Google Translate says a tocayo is a namesake. And I asked them all. Well, a namesake <laughs> and... Um, uh what's the other one the um so oh yeah namesake but in spanish it's also a person that's that that you're named or that you has your same name yeah sure right uh, carry on sorry um and i asked all my friends who don't know spanish i was like would you ever call your buddy who happens to have the same name as you your namesake like if i say hey namesake how you doing because there's another marco there and everybody all down the line 50 people no never 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 no 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 never, never heard never, of never, it never. Absolutely not. Your namesake in English is only your grandfather or your uncle or whoever you're named after. Um, it's never somebody your age who's not related to you. And so, um, and then me puso el ojo, if you are familiar with what that means, um, you can come up with some way to say that in English, but it would take some explanation. There's no really short uh, way to convey that very culturally bound idea um, in the same number of words. Right. Yeah, it can be done, but just that <laughs> concisely. And then, and then slang like uh, "onta" for "donde está" and "chingadera," just totally um, generic and slightly vulgar. Uh, what you call it? Thingamajig thing. Mm -hmm. And so, just out of curiosity, I put these three into um, Google Translate, which you cannot trust, which is not your friend and came up with this. I went to the club with my friend for Fui al antro con mi comadre. We've lost that it's a female speaker and a close friend and a female friend. Y tocayo me puso el ojo. My namesake gave me the eye. I don't even know what it means to give someone the eye. Is that good or bad? Is that like <laughs> gave me the evil eye? And then onta. Onta just means onta. Onta, yeah. <laughs> it's just what that means. And chinga that is shit. You know, that's a, that's a legitimate. Yeah. Translation. Yeah, I go with that. Yeah, it could be. But the onta meaning onta. <laughs> okay. Sure. And and as a court interpreter, you often are are dealing with text message exchanges between like the couples getting divorced and they've taken screen captures and submitted those into evidence and it's just a bunch of misspelled words and contractions and like autocorrect errors where it's an English autocorrect trying to handle Spanish slang and you have to guess what the original word was before it got autocorrected. And, oh, yeah. and there's just layers of difficulty. You, you, you want to get those in advance so you have time to study them out. Yeah, yeah. Onward. I like these uh, suggestions here in the yeah. chat. If you don't have the chat open and open it up, everyone, you can see the uh, ideas that other people are throwing out. Good, good suggestions. So, Marco, how do you pass the state test? Well, they're not easy to pass. The, the written test, last time I ran the numbers, had about a 50% pass rate, and you have, to, you have to pass the written test before you can take the oral test, and the oral test had about a 20, 25% pass rate. So a lot of people go into these unprepared. They just figure I'm bilingual. You know, I've, I've worked for you know, an attorney before. I t deal with this stuff all the time, but they don't actually study and train and drill over uh, recordings and so they have to go back and take it again or they give up. Um, I like to uh, help people uh, prepare realistically so that they will not just be ready with the knowledge and the skills but also the emotional side of um, not freaking out when they are in this high pressure testing situation. But the process of learning to be ready for the test involves learning about the basics of the legal system, criminal law specifically, not uh, civil law, like the steps of a trial and the different parties involved in a typical case. Um, then there's a lot of uh, legal vocabulary. I'd say a few hundred terms, at least in English and Spanish, you should have 
at your fingertips. So you can, you know, if you hear a word like um, arraignment or subpoena or affidavit, you should be ready um, in a second or two to come up with the term in Spanish and vice versa. Uh, you should uh, be able to cite translate legal documents. You're looking at a page in English and you're saying it in Spanish, you're looking at a page in Spanish and saying it in English as if you're reading it aloud. Uh, you have to learn how to consecutively interpret witness testimony where a lawyer is talking to a witness. She's speaking English and he's speaking Spanish and you're passing the messages back and forth between them basically. And you have to show that you can do simultaneous interpretation too, where one person's just speaking English on and on and on and on, like a judge giving instructions to the jury and you're listening in English and you're speaking without interruption into Spanish as it goes on. And that tends to be the, like the most complicated one to learn because it's the least natural mental process. There's so much multitasking going on. Uh, you, as part of the st uh, study process, you'll be recording yourself and then going back and listening to it and pretending like you're one of the graders. You have a, a copy of uh, how they grade you. And so you can apply the same rules and look for the same kinds of mistakes and figure out Am I ready to pass this at a 70% uh, accuracy rate or not? Do I need to keep on working on it? And it's also important to have other people that you're studying with, not just to practice with you, but to stay motivated and to check in on you and help you out when you're feeling frustrated or unmotivated. All right. This, okay. this, this is the exciting one. Oh, this <laughs> is the exciting one. Oh, it's so thrilling. Okay, so here's the deal. It's going to cost you some money to do this, and there's just no way around that. But it's not, if you look at the bottom, it says total cost 700 if you pass all the tests the first time, but you don't have to plunk down $700 up front right now to start this process. A little at a time, and you'll get through it. Um, you start off with an orientation class. Uh, we offer one. Uh, it's a six-hour course that the state of Texas requires um, to start the process. And, you go through the class, you take whatever quiz and different things like that. You're done, you get a certificate. The certificate is good for two years. So the price range for that class varies wildly, but- um, The $2,500 one is like a semester of college that is also counts as an orientation. Right. And it's much more in depth. You, yeah, get the certificate <laughs> at the end. Um, but that's good for two years. So you start with that and then you've got two years to finish the process before you would need to take that um, orientation class again. Then you submit an application. So I would say don't do the application until you're ready. Do some of the studying, do some of the, the practices and, and kind of get a feel for what it is that you're you're getting yourself into and decide, yes, this is something I wanna do, application. All right, pass a background check, a few dollars there as well. Next is the written exam, hundred bucks there. Um, those are given quarterly. You have to pass the written, as Marco said, before you can take the oral so if you have to do that more than once, well, that's going to cost you more. But if you prepare before you take it, then you may only have to take it once. I, I really agree with Marco that, that most people just go into thinking, I got this. I speak Spanish. I speak English. How hard can this be? And then they're surprised. But if you do some preparing, you study some vocabulary, you do some flashcards or quizlets or whatever, and prepare some, then that written exam is gonna go a lot better. So you pass that, you go on to the oral, also given every quarter, so every three months um, here in Austin, and then you pass that. If you don't pass, you can retake. You're just spending some extra money, but you can retake these because they're given often enough that one oral exam or one written exam, you've still got several orals that you can take before that, that written test expires. So there's time and it does cost some bucks, but over the course of two years, $700 isn't too much. And as we talked about earlier, if you can average a hundred bucks an hour actually interpreting, then you can make that 700 bucks in a day in your first day, maybe not your first day, but theoretically, theoretically yeah, yeah, it could happen. And so the, the cost isn't too much when you consider the gain. All right, so what does the written exam look like? If you've, can you remember taking the SAT or ACT, the English section that has lots of big words on it, it's kind of like that. Or if you've taken the, the GRE or um, the TOEFL exam, uh, they want to see, do you understand college level English terminology? 
Uh, if you have a sentence like this, a person who feels persecuted in his or her home country may apply for political, put in the chat, A, B, C, or D, political appellation, appraisal, asylum, or ascendance. What do you think? And the winner is C, 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 S, O, S. Asylum. 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 Asilo político. Yes. Or uh, it was done pursuant to, find uh, an explanation and definition of pursuant to the proceedings of the court, in accordance with, in addition to, in conjunction with, or in spite of. ¿Qué opinan ustedes? Uh, fue hecho de acuerdo a los procedimientos de la corte. Uh, fue uh, et, this is Esther. Uh, fue hecho de acuerdo a los procedimientos de la corte. Right, but okay. look, at the, look at the answer choices. Because this part is only in English. You don't have to translate it or interpret it into to a different language. You just need to know what it means, how else you can say it in English. Right. So knowing just what the terms relate to, what they mean, how else you could say them, making sure you understand the legal system. Yeah, for the written it. test, don't even study anything in Spanish because there's not a word of Spanish on it. And then um, the breakdown of the written exam is like this. Uh, most of the questions are sentence completion. Um, then there's a lot of idioms, uh, figures of speech, expressions. Uh, do you understand it? You don't have to know an equivalent idiom in the other language, but you do have to understand what it means so that you can come up with an explanation when you're interpreting. Because again, this is just English. It's only English. All the questions and all the answers for the written exam are only in English. And there's a lot of synonyms and antonyms, and then smaller sections of court procedures and ethics, which you'll get in your six hour orientation course. Okay, you wanna explain how site translation works? Okay, so as we mentioned earlier, there are three sections. You've got um, simultaneous interpreting, consecutive interpreting, and site translation. Simultaneous being you're speaking while they're speaking, consecutive, just like, um, Books in a, uh, the consecutive books in a series are the ones that come after the next, you know, this one comes after this one comes after this one. So you're, someone's talking and then you talk and someone else talks and you talk and you take turns. And then there's site translation. Uh, I, I'm just trying screen. to figure out who's got her mic off because I can hear noises in the background and these all show that they're off. So okay. let me get back over to here. So site translation, you're given a document and it's not something you've seen before and you're not going to in your in the courtroom, you're not going to well in the courtroom, you might have your phone, but in the test, you're not going to have your phone and you're not going to have a dictionary and you're just going to have to pick up the piece of paper and read it in your target language. So it will be in English and you will need to read it in, in this case, Spanish, just as though it were written in Spanish. So. My so, lovely assistant, Vanna White. I'll, I'll demonstrate the first paragraph. If I were handed this and asked to read it aloud, I would say, Yo, Eric Turner, un ciudadano de esta ciudad que uh, reside actualmente a 200 Madera, Madero Avenue, uh, comparezco y declaro que estoy aquí para presentar una denuncia formal contra John Doe, la persona responsable por los delitos constituidos por los hechos siguientes. Etcétera, uh, etcétera. Right. And so you'll have one page in English and one page in Spanish on the oral exam. And you've got three minutes to, is that right? Uh, like a, a minute and a half to review it and then three and a half minutes to interpret it. There you go. There you go. So you've got a little time to look it over, read through it, um, consider how you want to say it all. Um, and then you go. And you notice he wasn't rushing through. He wasn't racing to get through it. You've got enough time to think and speak. So take a deep breath and then away you go. Simultaneous. Okay, so this is where you are having one person. All right, so don't look. Okay. This is where you're going to have one person um, re speaking in English. And so on the exam, this is for the oral, you'll be listening to a, a an audio recording mm -hmm. of, the, um, of somebody saying this stuff. And then you will be speaking into microphone recording your interpretation of it. So for the sake of this example, I'm going, he's got his eyes closed. He's not looking at it. I mean, he's seen it before, but uh, keep your eyes closed. I'm going to read it. You'll be able to hear me some, but he's going to sit close to the microphone so you can hear him better. And so he's going to interpret without looking at it, uh, just like you would in court. In court, they don't hand you all the documents of what they're saying. They just start talking and you just start interpreting. 
Okay, so you ready? Listo. Damas y caballeros, me gustaría agradecerles mucho por su servicio en este, de, como el jurado en este caso. Ahora oirán mi declaración inicial, lo que es mi oportunidad para señalar lo que las pruebas enseñarán en este caso. Por tener el, porque el peso de la prueba me recae a mí como el fiscal, me toca ir primero. Después tendrán la oportunidad de escuchar al defensor. Sorry, that's really confusing because I'm hearing you talking and it's distracting me from what I'm trying to read. Oh, sorry. oh I know. It's confusing for me too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's simultaneous. And then finally, um, there's a consecutive mode where you uh, listen to an attorney asking a Spanish speaking witness questions and you interpret in both directions. Um, so for the, you want to be both people? I'll be both people. Okay. And again, and I won't look. Oh, okay. And for the sake of, of, um, you knowing who I am. Well, I guess you don't really know. You, you'll need to know. I, the cues, I will pretend I'm the attorney or whatever, and I'll use a deeper voice. Okay. And then Layla, when I'm Layla, I'll use a higher <laughs> voice. I okay. Eyes are there. closed. Okay. If you would, please, state your name for the record. Uh, si sería tan amable, uh, declare su nombre para que conste en actas. Layla Coronado. Layla Coronado. And Ms. Coronado, how do you know the accused in this case? Y señorita Coronado, ¿cómo es que conoce al acusado en este caso? Él es mi ex esposo, que se vaya lejos. He's my ex-husband, and good riddance. Please tell us if you were living with him back on May 19th, 2014, if you recall. Por favor, díganos si usted vivía con él en el 19, 19 de mayo de 2014, si se acuerda. Is that 2000? Yeah. Okay. So in real life, you better have your notebook and your pencil there on the test too to write down dates and addresses and people's names and a list because those kind of details are the, the first to slip out of your short-term memory. Okay, we're going to have to go job. through the whole thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leila Coronado. Oh, you're very welcome. <laughs> no, okay. And then this last slide we're just going to gloss over because this is for people who uh, are unemployed and looking for a job. And if uh, you fall into this category, um, you will find that once you get your court interpreting credential, then you, you don't just sit around waiting for people to contact you. You have to go out and let them know that you're available to interpret. And you meet people and you join associations and you make uh, contacts and you send out emails and anytime you get hired, you make a real good impression. So people want to bring you back and you give them your business cards. And it's just like um, any sole proprietorship building up your uh, client list little by little. The first year you spend a lot of time marketing and then each year after that less and less because you're getting more and more repeat business. If you are already employed full time, then this won't be an issue for you. Though you may need to sell your boss on the idea that you should be a licensed interpreter and the organization should pay for it. It'd be nice if, if they sponsored your studies yeah. and gave you time to study on the job. That'd be even better. <laughs> okay, so there are a lot of things that you will think, okay, I, I'm ready for this. I know how this is going to work and this is going to be great. But there are some things that are going to make you make that face that that little girl is making. Like, what? So half the time your gigs cancel they just are like oh well the trial was reset or uh it turns out the person can't come come in for the deposition today or you know the whatever happens i don't know somebody's sick or whatever and so um so gigs get canceled no big deal um but um you and we're gonna cover what what do you do about that um you don't work in trials all the time it is not always murder case, murder case, murder case, which frankly is a good thing because that's intense. Um, you do other kinds of interpreting on a smaller scale, it, like we talked about earlier, like in a, a law office or, or even in, in judges' chambers, um, you're not always in a trial interpreting depositions or, or just um, interviewing witnesses or things like that. Um, and a lot of the time that you are in a courtroom, you're sitting and waiting for your um, your case to be called on the docket. Um, you are getting paid to be there. So if they say we need you here at nine o'clock and you show up at nine o'clock, then you are on the clock and you are getting paid to be there. If they don't call your case until 1130, great. Have a computer and do something else while you wait because you are being paid to be there at the ready when they need you. you like can, a firefighter. Yeah. 
Um, you also get paid for cancellations. When you send your rate sheet to the attorney or the court reporter or whoever it is that's hiring you, you can put your cancellation policy on there and you can say um, any cancellations within 24 hours of the uh, assigned date or time or whatever will incur this much of a fee or 48 hours or however, however you wanna um, structure that. You will find that some judges and attorneys are used to working with non-English speakers or less English proficient speakers of English and they kind of know the routine. And then you'll find that some really have no experience with interpreting and don't really know what your role is or how it's supposed to work. And you may need to gently and respectfully help them understand your role as an officer of the court and how, how the interpreting needs to work to facilitate a good outcome for everyone. Um, also different kinds of cases that require different skills um, and different vocabulary. And so you may get real good at one kind of case and then suddenly you're thrown into a different kind and you're like, oh, well, <laughs> this is new and different. <laughs> what are they talking about? And that's fine. <laughs> then you learn new things and everyone's a little nervous and scared at the beginning, whether it's a, a, you've been doing it a while, but this is a new case or you're walking into a courtroom for the first time and you're like, oh, I hope I'm not the one that ends up in jail. Like it, it can be a little nerve wracking, but <sighs> deep breath. It's going to be okay. If you've passed the exam, then you are ready. You are prepared. You are capable of doing the job of a court interpreter and you can do it. And if you need to, <laughs> you need to take a break or, or ask for something from the court, you know, you can, you can do that. It's going to be okay. Pretend to faint. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's a question here from Robbie. Um, yes, you are permitted to repeat the oral exam. We, we've heard urban legends of people repeating like a dozen times over the years. Um, the, I think in Texas, the current policy, and this changes from state to state and from year to year, but I think they make you wait six months before you retake it. So you could take it twice a year. And I think the written exam is good for, well, I don't know how long the written exam is good for, but your, your intro from the clock starts ticking when you take your your um, orientation training and so from that point to the time that you pass your your oral exam is two years and so um yeah so that's kind of the cutoff All right but no there's no limit for how many times you can take it uh question from esther uh, can you please list oh. the name and author of the textbook you mentioned at the beginning yeah. here holly Nicholson. You want to show that? I'll type it in the chat. I can't tell Oh, can let me move this down there. there. Uh, the company is called Acebo. Uh, the out. author is Holly, and then some weird, like, Icelandic spelling of Mickelson. Is it double S? Two Ks. Oh, uh, two Ks, and everything K -K -E else is one. And this book is called The Interpreter's Edge, but there are some other ones that uh, the same company sells that are highly regarded. I used them back during the Lincoln administration when I was <laughs> studying for this. Um, all right, okay. so this uh, these are just some links that you will get in the PDF copy of this. Everybody should have gotten an email about uh, two hours ago from me. If you haven't seen it, then it is in your spam because I sent it to everybody who had registered for this course as of two hours ago. And that will have the slides on there and links that you can click on. And now we are ready to, oh, um, next steps, uh, read what the NCSC has to say about the test because they're the ones who created it. Read what the state of Texas has to say about it because they're the ones who administer it. Then find some self-study materials, free or paid. I find that paying something for self-study materials motivates me to study more because I feel like I wanna get my money's worth, but it's up to you depending on your resources. Uh, here are links to a couple of my um, classes uh, that I teach, and you should visit courthouses. In fact, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm leading a courthouse tour, and I do that a couple times a year. If you aren't used to being in court, then it's kind of an eye opener to see how it works, and it helps you to hear a lot of the language that's used by judges and lawyers, and take notes and figure out what you need to learn how to be able to say. And there's a really nice, pretty new courthouse, uh, civil courthouse here in, in Austin. In Austin, yeah. yeah. So shiny Just and sparkly. Opened. And, and get stuff on the calendar. Use your Google Calendar, your iCalendar, whatever, and, and put a recurring 
a reminder on there to study. I like to study every day first thing because that keeps me from procrastinating it until later in the day. And um, if you just say, I'll study when I have free time, then you never actually have free time. You don't make progress. That's like saying, I'm gonna go to the gym and get in shape when I feel like it. No one ever feels like going to the gym and getting in shape. <laughs> and I, I like even more the goals, it's not just putting, I'm gonna study, I'm gonna study, I'm gonna study on the calendar, but I'm going to study this set of vocabulary and know it by the end of this week. And, and I like to work backwards. Here's my, my exam date. I'm going to put this on the calendar and say, this is when I'm going to take the exam. And so I'm going to, you know, by this point, I need to know this much vocabulary and I'm going to break it down even more and say, in this point, I'm going to know this little bit of vocabulary. And in this point, so each week I kind of have some, some stepping stones and I know what, what's coming next and how much I should know by which point. So those goals help you to just keep yourself on track. Um, and especially if you've got a study partner, then you can say, okay, we, by this point, we've got to, you know, this is when we're going to quiz each other on these terms, or this is when we're going to practice this skill. Yeah. And uh, so that's, I just find that to be especially useful. Uh, limit of times to retake the written exam. I don't think so. Nope. No. Until, Again, time until the cows limit. come home. Time limit from your orientation course to. Yeah, um, you may have to retake uh, the orientation or something. Yeah. But then you can just take the exam again and take the exam again. Yep. They, they recreate the exam every so often, so it's not going to be the exact same Different exam versions. every yeah. time. Okay. Well, this concludes the uh, slideshow. And now we would welcome um, any other questions that came up. And there's, there's no such thing as a dumb question. I mean, if you tried really hard, you could come up with a dumb he one. comes up with some <laughs> dumb ones sometimes. But but don't feel don't feel embarrassed to ask a, a basic question because we've covered a lot of material and I'm sure we've skipped something important to you. And you can unmute yourself and talk or you can put it in the chat, whatever you like. 